A chainsaw is one of the most efficient cutting machines you're ever likely to use. It's also one of the most dangerous. In this section, we'll look at the inbuilt safety features on a chainsaw, the personal protective equipment you should wear, and other equipment you should carry while using the saw. We'll also look at the environmental care procedures you should follow when handling fuel, oil and cleaning fluids. And we'll cover the basic provisions in the Occupational Health and Safety Act that are designed to protect you and your workmates from injury or mishaps. Let's start by describing the main safety features on a chainsaw. All modern saws have a front handguard and chain brake. Their purpose is to stop the chain if the saw suddenly kicks back while it's running. When kickback occurs, the saw is generally thrown upwards and back towards the operator in an arc. The guard is designed to push into your left hand, forcing it forward and activating the chain brake. A second chain brake mechanism built into the saw is the inertia brake, which is activated when it senses that the saw is flicking back suddenly. The throttle lockout is a control on top of the handle which needs to be depressed when you squeeze the throttle trigger. This arrangement is sometimes called a double action throttle, and it's designed to stop the saw from revving up if you accidentally bump the throttle trigger. Vibration dampeners are fitted to reduce the amount of vibration that's transmitted from the motor to the handles. This helps to cut down on fatigue in your arms and hands and minimises the chance of nerve damage developing from using the saw over a long period of time. The chain catcher is designed to catch the chain if it breaks or comes off the guide bar. The rear handguard is the wide piece under the rear handle. It's there to protect your hand if the chain breaks or derails from the guide bar. Remember there's no such thing as a left-handed chainsaw, so your right hand should always be at the back. The stop control shuts off the engine and stops the saw. Whatever the model of saw you're using, it will always be within easy reach of your right thumb. A reduced kickback chain has little ramps that help to guide obstacles over the front of the cutters to lessen the chance of kickback occurring. We'll look at chain design in more detail in the next section. Two features on the guide bar which improve safety are a sprocket nose and a narrow profile in the shape of the nose. The sprocket allows the chain to run more tightly and with less friction than a nose without a sprocket would. A narrow profile reduces the size of the kickback zone. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail later. And lastly, when you're not using the saw, keep the guide bar cover on the bar to protect yourself from cuts and the chain from damage. The muffler and spark arrestor are fitted to the front of the saw. The muffler is designed to reduce the noise level and direct exhaust gases away from the operator. The spark arrestor is the small metal screen that catches sparks that might come out of the exhaust system to minimise the chance of the sparks causing a fire. The personal protective equipment you wear or carry with you depends to some extent on the type of work you're doing and whether you're in the forest or at an established yard or factory. Let's look at the main items of PPE and the environments you'd need to wear them in. Starting from the top, the first thing you need is a safety helmet or hard hat. This is designed to protect your head from falling objects. Your safety helmet needs to be replaced whenever it reaches its expiry date, or if it shows any signs of cracks or damage. A face shield or visor is necessary to protect your eyes from flying particles. Some operators also wear wraparound glasses for extra protection. Earmuffs or earplugs are needed to protect your hearing from being damaged by the very loud noise levels that chainsaws emit. A high visibility vest or jacket is needed to make you stand out from the surroundings so that other workers in the area can see you easily. 
In cold weather, it's a good idea to wear gloves. In some workplaces, it's a requirement that you wear them at all times while you're handling a chainsaw. If you are wearing gloves, make sure they're a good fit and suitable for the task. Protective trousers, or chaps, contain cut-resistant material, which is designed to stall the saw if the chain comes into contact with it. Chaps worn with shorts are popular when conditions are hot, but you do need to be more careful with sticks and twigs that might get caught up in the straps, and also biting insects. And finally, steel-capped safety boots are generally required everywhere. If you're working in the forest, it's also a good idea to have boots with good ankle support. There are various other items of equipment that you may need to carry, depending on where you're working and what sort of work you're doing. If you're in the forest, you'll need to carry enough fuel and oil for the day's work, as well as an axe, wedges and hand tools for tensioning and sharpening the chain. You may also need a cant hook if you're going to be working with large logs or fallen trees. Every team also needs to carry an approved first aid kit, stocked with suitable supplies. Working in a remote area can also present problems with communications. Some forest owners require all personnel to carry a UHF radio to stay in contact with other people in the area while they're working. But generally speaking, the best advice is don't work alone in a remote area. And always make sure you have a vehicle on hand to get you out of the forest in an emergency. You should also have a system in place for regular checks to be made on you either by radio or from someone dropping in, if you're working in an isolated area. If you're in a timber yard or factory, all of the tools and equipment you need will probably be on hand, supplied by the company. But always make sure you know where the first aid kit is kept, so you can go straight to it in an emergency. Wherever you're working, you need to be familiar with your rights and responsibilities under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. This act gives you the right to raise any safety problems with your boss or supervisor and have them taken seriously. For example, if you think that something you've been asked to do is unsafe, or you think you haven't been trained properly to do a particular task, you have every right to go to your boss and sort out the problem before anyone gets hurt or is put at risk. The OHS Act also gives you certain responsibilities, such as the responsibility to abide by the company's safety policies and procedures, and to report any hazards that you notice. You also have a duty of care towards others in the workplace, which means that you must take reasonable care of the health and safety of anyone who might be affected by your actions. A good way of ensuring that you've taken everything into account before you start a job is to carry out a risk assessment of the area you'll be working in. The purpose of a risk assessment is to identify any hazards in the area, assess the risks of each hazard causing an accident or injury, and control the risk either by removing the hazard or minimising its effect. Here's a simple example of a risk assessment form that you might use before starting your day's work in the forest. A similar type of document is the Job Safety Analysis, or JSA, which lists all of the things that need to be done to complete a particular job, and any safety factors that need to be considered. Environmental care procedures are an important part of every operator's responsibilities. You're probably aware that fuel, oil and cleaning fluids can be very damaging to the environment if they're allowed to escape. That's why you need to take care when you're handling them. The company you work for may already have written procedures on how to store, use and dispose of hazardous substances. But if they don't, Here's a few guidelines on what to do. Store all fluids in approved containers with the lids firmly sealed when you're not using them. Use a container with a good spout or use a funnel when you're filling up the fuel and oil reservoirs so that you don't spill any while you're pouring. 
Make sure you dispose of hazardous liquids properly. Don't tip them on the ground or pour them down the sink or into a stormwater drain. This is how creeks and rivers get contaminated, and it can have a devastating effect on the local plant and animal life. Instead, put the liquids into containers and have them taken to a waste disposal depot. If your worksite has a trade waste disposal system, you can pour the liquid straight into the trade waste drain because it will be treated and disposed of properly. On a general safety note, you should also remember that oil, fuel and cleaning liquids can cause dermatitis and other conditions including skin cancer. So you should always be careful to wash the liquid off straight away if you do get any on your skin. If you find yourself coming into regular contact with these substances, make sure that you wear gloves while you're using them. <laughs>